What's going on, YouTube? It's your buddy Will from the What's Up in the Sky 37 channel. We're online at www.whatsupinthesky.com. And we are back with a little space news. Been a little bit here. Try to be maybe one or two a week if I can. Just get out the latest articles and things I think are cool, just in case you missed it. Um, this is going to be an interesting one. Memory reformat plan for the Opportunity rover. Here's space.com space, uh, did a good one. Um, maybe I'll, space.com has a lot of good articles. A lot of them are actually from there this week. All right, Mars Opportunity rover to have a memory wipe. Apparently this thing's been uh, bombing out. At least tw it's, it, it apparently takes one day to reload the software on it. Um, so what happens is, I guess it's restarting, and when it restarts, it has a backup mode that reloads the original, like, uh, if you know anything about computers, I'm an IT director. If you know anything about computers, basically it puts on the uh, image. It's, a, it's just an image on there that copies to it, and then it has to load everything up, turn it back on. So apparently it takes a day or so to do it. Um, so like any computer on Earth, long-duration space robots, memories sometimes need to be reformatted. This is certainly the case for NASA's veteran MER Opportunity that has our more than its fair share of computer glitches recently. So the time has come, according to the mission manager at NASA's JPL in Pasadena, California, the little robot needs a memory wipe. This decision to re reformat Opportunity's flash memory early next month is prompted by multiple computer resets the rover has been experiencing. This month alone, Opportunity has had to reboot it dozen times, interrupting valuable time that should be taken up without carrying out science missions or carrying out science near the rim of the Endeavor crater. Um, so worn out cells in the flash memory are leading suspect and cause these resets, says JPL's John, Kip I guess John Callis. Project Manager for NASA's Mars Exploration Rover Project. The flash reformatting is low-risk process as critical sequences and flight software are stored elsewhere in non-volatile memory on the rover. Flash memory allows data to be stored from opportunity surface operations even when the rover is powered down state. Not so many dissimilar to the memory that stores photos inside your cell phone. Or important documents in a memory stick or even flash drive becomes worn out due to continuous use. Reformatting Opportunity's flash drive will identify corrupt or damaged cells, flagging them to be avoided by using the rover's computers, hopefully preventing the unexpected research that are plaguing the mission. Five years ago, the team successfully performed a reformat of sister rover Spirit's memory due to stave off the battle of amnesia events it was experiencing. Sadly, in 2010, NASA had called off the efforts to contact the rover as it became jammed in a sand trap at Gustav Crater months earlier. Over a decade after landing on the Red Planet in 2004, this will be the first memory reformat for Opportunity. The one NASA engineers are confident will be trouble-free. Before the reformat can begin, Opportunity's handlers will download all the available data from the Opportunity's flash drive and switch it into a mode that does not use flash memory. Then the reformat can commence. So, hey, imagine sitting here. I, I have to do it here sometimes on Earth. Imagine having to reformat something all the way up there. Um, I think it's a pretty pretty simple thing for what it sounds like. We'll see what happens with it. I hate to lose opportunity. It's still putting out good stuff. I haven't used a lot of its pictures lately, but I still get them. People send them to me all the time. I'm still checking them out. Um, these curiosity just been ridiculous lately with Anomaly. So, all right. I thought this was pretty cool. This is from NASA. 3D printer could turn space station into a machine shop. I love these 3D printers. Ever since I've been hearing about them, I wanted one. Um, I mean, it's just awesome. Imagine to be able to just have like a part for something you need for a car or something, anything small. Like I needed some parts for my pool. Um, it would be amazing just to be able to sit there and take the old one, scan it, and print one out with this hard plastic stuff. So um, <laughs> I won't read all this, all this to you, but a 3D printer, first ever to be flown in space, it could change the way NASA does business aboard the space station. The 3D printing and zero-G technology demonstration led out of NASA's Marshall Flight Center in Huntsville, Alabama, provided a Small Business Innovative Research Award to Made in Space, Inc. to build the first 3D printer for operation in microgravity. It is scheduled to launch the space station aboard a SpaceX-4 resupply mission. The project is supported by three NASA customers, the International Space Ah, Space Station Technology Department office. So you wouldn't hear any of that. But basically, researchers hope to show a 3D printer can work normally in space and produce parts equitable to those printed on the ground. It works by extruding heated plastic, which then builds layer upon layer to create these three-dimensional objects. Testing on the station, a first step towards creating a workable machine shop in space. The capability may decrease costs and risk on the station, but will be critical when space explorers venture far from Earth or we create an on-demand supply chain for needed tools and parts. I mean, this is smart because honestly these people are definitely gonna if we're gonna be taking off places we're gonna need stuff's gonna break i mean th this is amazing eventually these things will probably be so good they'll be able to keep heat they'll be able to do this with metal eventually i'm sure it's coming to that so i mean it'll probably be done 
So some sort of, I mean, look at look at Curiosity rover. It's running off nuclear energy. So I mean, eventually it's going to be something. It's going to be amazing what we're going to be able to do. And we have to keep that with us. You know what I mean? Like they said, they're going to need this resin, the polymers and resin that they use to do the 3D printing. Um, but I'm not going to read the rest of that. If you want to learn more about 3D printing, if you don't know about it, just put it into Google. There's a lot of good. There, there's like two or three companies that are doing it, and they're really doing it really good. So or put it in YouTube. There's some good stuff there. So. Now, this is called a Zodiac. I thought this was pretty cool. This is a video that came up. Um, it was unusual pyramid of light brightness in September. This is the sky watching for September. There's some awesome stuff coming up. But check this out here. This is this is the light that starts coming up. The people often think this and they mistake this for, uh, you know, the sun coming up. But this is pretty much around Jupiter. It's confused with the Milky Way and um, sometimes called the false see. dawn. I shouldn't really be playing it that. It can even look like but... faint city lights. If yeah, it looks like city lights coming up. Sunrise. So if you see this before sunrise. It's the reflection of Let's sunlight see. off cosmic dust particles. The debris from comet and asteroid collisions in our solar system. Some of these dust particles enter Earth's atmosphere as sporadic or random meteors. But most of the dust particles producing the zodiacal light settle into a lens or pancake-shaped tapering cone of light, fattest near the Sun and extending all the way out to Jupiter's orbit. Most of the material is located near the plane of the solar system, the ecliptic, the flat... Yeah, so basically it's Jupiter's reflection. Apparently this stuff is so bright and it's pretty beautiful. So if you see this coming out, that's don't worry about it. <laughs> it's not the sun coming up. Because they call it some sort of uh, triangle here. So pyramid of light. So that's Jupiter right there. You're going to be seeing that right in the morning before the sun comes up. And then that, it's about an hour or two before it comes up. So I thought that was pretty neat. Um, all right, so Europe, Europe's been in the rover. So actually, if that's what they're sending, it looks like spirit, but this is an artist's conception. Isn't it amazing what an artist's conception can actually look like now? Look at that picture. I mean, that's ridiculous. Um, picking a landing site on Mars is a complex process. There are need to balance scientific return with capabilities of whatever vehicle you're sending out there. And given each mission costs millions, sometimes billions, or if you're NASA, it costs $2.5 billion. And you put shitty wheels on the thing, so it can't ride around forever, even though you made it nuclear-powered. Which, which will pretty much run mostly forever in our terms of our lives, but no, that's, that's, you know, that's NASA for you, so let's put shitty wheels on it. And you can only, excuse my language, and you only get one shot of landing. You can bet the mission planners are extra cautious about choosing the right location. A recent paper in EOS details just how difficult it is to choose where to put down a rover, with references to the upcoming European ExoMars mission that will launch in 2018. In March, scientists, then NASA's March, they're going to put up the like, second Curiosity looking rover in 2020. 20, I believe. Um, in March, scientists came together to select the first Canada landing sites and to come up with four finalist locations. The goal of ExoMars is to look for evidence of life, whether past or present, and one of its defining features in the two-meter drill that will be able to bore through the below the surface. Oh, wow. 6.6 foot drill. So that's pretty badass. Um, something that NASA's curiosity does not possess. Among the highest priority sites are those subject sediments of hydrothermal deposits, reads the paper. So basically, they're just trying to find a place to put this. Sounds like they've gotten it down to four. It's interesting to find out uh, what they're going to do with it. Um, so we're going to have more rovers coming up. It's hard to get these things on the planet. I mean, it, NASA's been very lucky. But a lot, I mean, European Space Agency has sent a lot of things to Mars. They have not hit... They, haven't landed in orbit. They, it, it's pretty hard to get stuff on Mars. So, good luck, guys. Hopefully, you get it there. Hopefully, you send back real pictures. You know, send that thing up with some like telescoping lenses and stuff that we can actually see. And give us the real pictures because uh, it, it's amazing what we we get back from Curiosity. But some of the some of the editing is ridiculous. So, sniffing out alien life, stinky chemicals may be the key. We talked a little bit this last time. Sounds like this is going to be the way to go. People are looking for uh, you know certain chemicals and stuff. I'm gonna go ahead and I'll leave this. Uh, and now they've got these telescopes that have these. It's, it's amazing what electronics have done to telescopes and what you can find. So I thought that was pretty cool. I'm gonna leave that one and I uh, just put that one down in there. We talked. It's pretty much the same one we had last time, but a little bit different. Uh, vying for the same same thing saying we need to be looking for the chemicals of life uh, so
Jupiter's icy moon Europa, and this is always, they've always heard Europa, Europa, and Titan for life. So Jupiter's moon Europa doesn't look like a particularly inviting place for life to thrive. The icy satellite is nearly 500 million miles from the sun on average, but beneath the icy crust lies a liquid ocean with more water than Earth contains. This ocean is shielded from harmful radiation, making Europa one of the solar system's best bet to host alien life. That's one of the reasons Europa is so alluring to scientists. It has all the elements that are thought to be key for the origin of life, water, energy, and organic chemicals, the carbon-containing building blocks of life, scientists said in an event called the Lure of Europa. All the ingredients are there to make us think Europe is next place to go, NASA chief scientist Ellen Stofan said at the event, which was organized by the Planetary Society. It's looking for life. Just as a layer of ice over the pond allows the water beneath to stay liquid through the freezing winter, Europa's icy crust shields its enormous ocean despite the moon's great distance from the sun. As Europa travels around Jupiter, the massive planet bends and flexes the satellite, generally interior heats up, heats that keeps the water from freezing completely. Beneath the Europa's surface, active volcanoes may also heat the water, providing vents where bacterial life may thrive as it does on Earth. With a combination of volcanism and water, good things are going to happen, Stofan said. Furthermore, or further, it may be possible to probe to get to, through the Europa's crust and into the ocean below. A space mission should be able to get through the ice a few kilometers thick. Wow, I wonder how they would even imagine to do that. Um, that's all we need is let's just. <laughs> it's so sad that a man just thinks, oh, we're gonna go up there and get through two, two kilometers of ice, and let's just contaminate what's ever down there <laughs> with, with our hole. But. In addition to the Europa's ocean, the second potential site for life exists at the moon's subsurface lakes. Some bubbly, some bubbles of energy from beneath the surface don't make it all the way through the crust, but instead melt some of its ice. The lakes that form from the meltwater like, wow, last hundreds of thousands, perhaps millions of years. And scientists estimate that some of these lakes contain more water than North America's Great Lakes. That's pretty awesome. And the Great Lakes are huge. So at the end of last year, NASA's hate space... So NASA's Hubble Space Telescope discovered a third region where scientists could search for the ingredients of life. Geysers of water vapor erupting from Europa's southern hemisphere, following, possible allowing the flyby probe to sample the moon's subsurface sea from afar. Yeah, that'd be pretty cool. The seawater is spewing into space. Here's scientists to fly by and look at what's collecting on the windshield. Yeah, that would be pretty easy. So, An upcoming mission. Every 10 years? Damn. Ads. U.S. National Research Council issues a planetary science de what does that say? decalative view. The 2011 report ranked the exploration of Europa as one of the highest priority missions, but budget cuts to NASA and the focus on the inner solar system have so far kept any mission concept from coming to fruition. However, NASA's 2015 budget requests include funding to help plan the potential Europa mission. So that's pretty awesome. Check that out. I mean, we need to get up there and check it out. I mean, especially if the water's coming up. That'd be pretty cool just to send that... that that's more realistic right now, going up there getting some really, really, really high resolution pictures and maybe flying something by the uh, water vapors and the water eruptions than trying to actually you know, drill through that much ice. I don't know how it would be done. I'm sure we could send a, a bomb or something up there, something to have a great idea. So this, I thought this was kind of cool. If you know anything, uh, if you're into astronomy, you probably know about SLU, and uh, SLU is pretty neat. Uh, a lot of times when these asteroids or comets are coming by, they have, they have a channel on YouTube. They, they pretty much allow Internet access to it. It looks like they got a grant, a 30000 grant to get an awesome uh, new telescope. So a new telescope for the online. A parent company, a group that provides free telescopes, views on the Internet, has received a Connecticut government grant of 33 yeah, 30000 to buy a new telescope. The new telescope for the online SLU Community Observatory will be used as asteroid research. The telescope, whose size and perimeter were not disclosed in a press release, will form part of a network of observ observatories that are expected to help NASA choose candidate asteroids for manned missions. The agency intends to send astronauts to a space rock towed in orbit around the moon. Um, SLU and NASA plan to train citizen astronomers to do follow-up observations of asteroids found by professional astronomers to learn more about rocks, rotations, and size, which need to be figured out about the orbits. So this is pretty awesome. SLU is a neat thing. I'm really glad that they actually have, uh, they're getting that, because they, honestly, some of the best information came from there. When everybody kept saying that uh, Ison was going to kill us <laughs> or take out the power and stuff, they were the most realistic people. They had a great debunking of it. Not really debunking, but, you know, a great... Uh, let's get our heads out of our ass type thing. So I thought this was kind of cool. This is kind of what's up in the sky. China's first high resolution satellite captured these 10 incredible images. Um, looks like they've put some color on some of these. So I don't know exactly how, how 
amazing it is, but check this out. The red and brown tones represent different types of vegetation. See, I don't know if they're adding these, but it's pretty amazing looking at some of these. You can just pause and look at it if you want, or just click the link below. So that was beautiful right there. I'll leave you with that one. So there's another 10, there's another 5 or 10 over there. Just go ahead and check out that link. As always, if you check out the links below, all of them roll through. So what will happen with, are we going to lose the opportunity, Rover? What do you guys think? Comment below. What's up in the sky, 37? My name is Will. Hope you're having a good one. Kept it right at 15 minutes. Peace.